this is kind of a pre-introduction to the to the video. Uh, when I reviewed the cuttings uh, or the original video, I, I found that maybe I didn't do a very good job of describing the types of equipment. My experience with humidifiers <laughs> is, is primarily limited to three types. I'm, one of the type is the evaporative media type, the ultrasonic type, and the warm air type. And <clears throat> in the video, you will see examples of the ultrasonic and warm air type, but the uh, evaporative media type uh, I no longer have, so I don't have an example to physically show you the unit. But this was a unit that was installed. If this represents the furnace, return air coming back into the furnace, the blower blowing heated air out and into the discharge duct work, and this is the supply air in, into the house. Well, what happens is that this has a, a slot cut in the bottom of the duct and this, this uh, evaporative media type humidifier was inserted in that and it has a rotating wheel that is made of an absorbent type material, perhaps a, a, a paper related product, and it rotates the one I had was rotates in a bath of water and as the air heated air comes across this it causes evaporation and goes into the space and this one even had a direct connection to the water line so uh, it automatically made up water as the water uh, was evaporated into the space. Now the second type of humidifier that I talk about is represented again by this, uh, sorry this is a very crude sketch, but this rectangle is represented as the water storage. It holds about a gallon, maybe a gallon and a quarter depending on the unit. And it sits on a base that has a, a just a, has a, a arrangement for allowing water to flow into this basin and uh, then it has an ultrasonic transducer with an electronic circuit board that drives it and it produces a fog by breaking by mechanically breaking down this water into uh, microscopic size particles. Now these particles will just lay there Unlit, but it ha also has a little small fan which pushes air into this chimney or column and this is pushed out into the into the room and this is a water fog not water vapor but water fog that comes out of here once this fog is introduced into the room the microscopic particles of water evaporate and burst into a vapor supplying water vapor into this air inside the house. The second small little unit is, I, I refer to it as the warm air type, and instead of an ultrasonic unit, it has just an electric heater, and again it has a reservoir that holds a gallon perhaps, or a gallon and a quarter, depending on the design. And the water flows into a small reservoir. It's heated under this chimney affair and it actually boils off the water in a very small area. And that water, uh, when it bursts into a vapor, it pushes itself out of the chimney. It doesn't need any kind of a fan in order for this to happen. And coming out of the chimney, there's not a lot to be seen here. You may see a little bit of fog as this, some of the vapor may tend to condense slightly and then uh, revert back into a vapor. But uh, for the most part, the water vapor coming out of here is an invisible product. The means for feeding the water varies a little bit. Uh, one of my one of the ultrasonic types actually has a float arrangement here 
that keeps the water in, in this bottom uh, container uh, based on the float level. And another has um, just allows the water to drop and when, it, it, when this discharge nozzle is exposed it allows air to come up into the top and that allows more water to drop down as the water comes up it seals the opening and a vacuum is created here and it stops the flow and as I recall the warm air type also has that arrangement uh, the simplest of all is probably the warm air type because it, it has just a heating circuit no blower no electronic circuit well the electronics are limited basically if this runs out of water it will detect I, I believe this, the way this works is that it, the heated element temperature rises above boiling and it's sensed by a circuit here and it shuts itself off and locks it and to get it to reactivate you have to shut the power off and let the whole thing cool off before you're allowed to restart it. Um, the ultrasonic type has, uh, at least one of them has a uh, little donut shaped float on a micro switch and if this water level drops too low it shuts off the drive to the fan and the, and the ultrasonic a circuit board to, to stop operation. Hello folks, uh, I want to share with you some things that I believe I've learned concerning home humidifiers. Some of the information is based on fact, some of it's opinion, some of it may be useful and some of it could be just not true. Well, first of all, why use a humidifier? In the colder months of the year, with no humidity added to the air, I found that I could reach out to, let's say, something like a wall switch. And every time I want to reach for it, I'd get a, an inch or an inch and a half spark when it was extremely cold. And, and it was not a painful shock, but not something that I really pleased. I, I found myself reaching for something like my car keys where I could distribute the charge a bit, reach out and touch the grounded device or receptacle box and uh, dissipate the charge before I actually tried to operate the switch. I even found that I could take a fluorescent tube, stick my fingers on the, the pins at one end rub my feet on the carpet, hold the other end of the tube up to the uh, some grounded surface and I could actually see a flash through the tube uh, as, as my body discharged through the fluorescent tube. Well it's interesting, it's not something I really care to live with. In winter months I found that the skin on my legs, sometimes the shin of my legs would become flaky and itchy uh, and I experienced, didn't experience this problem in the, in, during the warmer months of the year. My wife also complained of having uh, uh, sinus headaches and occasional nosebleed during these cold months. But again, her symptoms also disappeared when the humidity levels in the house came up. My first experience with humidification equipment was a evaporative uh, media type uh, humidifier which was installed in the actual ductwork of the furnace. Basically this had a bath and a rotating drum with a media on the drum. The warm air from the furnace would pass over the rotating drum, evaporate and the water and then this would become the humidity added to the room. But I found this unit to be a real nuisance, a headache. Um, I had a trouble keeping the media uh, clean. Uh, usually it crusted up quite quickly. Even had a lot of crust build up around the uh, water bath. And this bath seemed to be uh, 
become murky and, and I was kind of worried about it growing mold. Um, and even the final disappointment with that unit was that I found that the ductwork downstream of the, of the unit was, was starting to rust from the humidity being released. As time passed, uh, uh, my family, me and my family moved to different residences and uh, uh, although most of the time we were in southern Missouri where the winters are probably much milder than those of you living up north uh, and when the temperatures were 30 to 50 degree range uh, indoor humidity seemed to be stay reasonable without adding any uh, water to the, to the air. However, the, the issues with low humidity and discomfort associated with it usually occurred when the outdoor temperatures were falling and staying below, low, let us say, 20 degrees. Incidentally, when I talk about temperatures, I'm talking about degrees Fahrenheit here. My experimentation found that the negative symptoms of low humidity seemed to go away once the humidity in the space reached 25% and higher and then I usually try to cap it at not over 40% uh, um, just because you don't want to encourage mold growth through high humidity. My next attempt at humidification was to purchase a small ultrasonic unit and, and this was a Honeywell unit that I have my hands on here which uh, I purchased and I think what really drew me to this was first of all there was no media to replace uh, they're relatively inexpensive probably around seventy dollars give or take uh, power requirements to run the unit is is quite low and uh, again not having to replace that media and, and fight those issues was a real improvement However, I found that, well, the home that we're living in presently has a floor space of about 2,400 square feet. And it's served by a single forced air furnace unit. And these small portable units are really, the manufacturer will say that they're designed to serve a room. However, when you have a forced air system in your home, the furnace picks this air up, circulates it around to all the rooms in the house, and in reality, while the humidity may be a bit higher in the room where this is located, you're really taking the humidity provided by this small portable unit and spreading it through the entire house. To rectify this situation, I did go ahead and buy a second uh, ultrasonic unit by a different manufacturer. I believe this is a Hometics unit, um, similar power requirements, similar capabilities, and uh, basically operated the two in tandem to, to bring the humidity up in the space. It was at this point I began to notice other issues. At the time when I first began using uh, these humidifiers, uh, I noticed that we still had a, a TV, an old style TV with a cathode ray tube uh, display and the cathode ray screen would seem to be coated with a white dust. Uh, the electrostatic charge on the, on the, on this, on these old cathode ray tube uh, picture tubes really picked up the dust. Also, I noticed I had an issue with the furnace filter. After a search of the internet, uh, I discovered that the likely source of uh, this, this white deposit was the minerals that was dissolved into the water. Now, in this particular, our house, this particular house is served by well water, and uh, the rock structure is primarily limestone, so if there's even a small amount of acid in the water, the, the, the limestone is dissolved into the, 
into the water and makes the water fairly hard. Uh, the internet search suggests that the problem could be solved using a um, perhaps using a uh, distilled water, but since I was using several gallons a day, that just really did not seem practical uh, or effective. Uh, it seemed that the ultrasonic units uh, break the water down into microscopic sized water droplets and discharge these droplets into the air. These droplets absorb heat from the air and then turn into vapor. However, the tiny droplets also contain with them the dissolved minerals. So as this water vaporizes, the minerals are left floating in the air as microscopic dust. Um, now, my internet search suggested that I could use a demineralization cartridge uh, that could be installed, but frankly, I never found those products very effective. I also became concerned that the dust being added to into our air by the humidifiers is a possible health hazard. This type of humidifier, this type of humidifier, the, the warm air humidifier, uh, heats the air to the boiling point, and the water basically you have the water broken down into a vapor, leaving the the minerals with inside around the heat chamber of the unit. Now that's great except of course it does require periodic cleaning of the heating unit to remove the buildup of uh, minerals. From my previous comments uh, you can tell that I don't have much use for the evaporative units uh, with the media type. They, these units often have, some of them have separate fans or pumps or rotating devices which make them slightly more expensive and also possible additional maintenance issue. There's also the possibility for bacteria growth in the, in the water since that water sets at basically room temperature. The ultrasonic units are nice from the standpoint that little maintenance is required just to add water to keep the system running. The disadvantage is the dust issue created, caused by the hard water. And again, there is some possibility, although I've never been aware of it, of bacteria growth in these units too because the water is always kept at basically room temperature. Whereas with the warm air unit, the water is actually boiled, so theoretically at least, a lot of the bacteria would not survive this unit, this uh, operation. Now, one of the disadvantages of, of this unit is that you do have, well, between three and four ounces of water in the very bottom of it, probably half of it immediately around the the heating element and that water is of course right at boiling temperature so if you've got a toddler around they could turn this unit over possibility of getting burned but the quantity of hot water is kept to a minimum by the design as you look at these humidifiers you see perhaps the most activity around the ultrasonic units and as you look at the warm air units you see perhaps a little bit of mist above the unit but by comparison a very small amount. The thing to remember is that what you're seeing on the el coming out of the ultrasonic unit is a mist. This is still water and it doesn't become a vapor until it evaporates in the airstream. Whereas with the warm air unit, 
it's being evaporated due to the high temperature in the, in the unit and any vapor you see is just a momentary vapor that forms because the water vapor has actually cooled enough to become a mist for a few seconds but because it's warm it immediately flashes back into the vapor and it's gone into the air. Now let's uh, move on and talk about what it costs to operate these humidifiers. What's it going to cost us to run these little humidifiers? Well, let's take a look first at the VIX warm air unit. Its input power, as measured uh, with a meter, was 253 watts. And its discharge rate was uh, 2.09 gallons per day on average. So the monthly cost to operate the warm air unit, one warm air unit, would be uh, divide this 253 by 1,000 to get kilowatts. So it would be 0.253 kilowatts, 24 hours a day, 30 days a month, and I'm paying about 14 cents per kilowatt hour for the power here at the house. So I'm estimating it's going to cost me $25.50 per month to run one of these. Now, <clears throat> remember that on occasion, uh, when the weather is severe, I'm running four of these. So I could add $100 to my electrical bill per month. So it's something to keep an eye on. I mean, this doesn't usually happen because... Here in southwest Missouri, we'll, we'll may have a, a week of really cold weather, then it'll warm up, and, and I reduce the, the number of units that I'm using to humidify the house, and so I'm not running four units out all the time. But now let's say, compare this to the ultrasonic cool air units, and the power input's only 20 watts. I'm sure that's what attracted me to these units to begin with and uh, their discharge rate on average was 1.39 gallons per day. Now I, on my two units I was seeing quite a variation from checked to, from time I checked to the next time I checked it and uh, so and fr frankly the uh, Home medics and and the uh, was had a slightly higher output than the uh, Honeywell unit, and I was not quite sure what was happening. Perhaps it's the age of the units. Maybe they're not quite producing as much as as they did when they were new. But anyway, I I, I saw quite a lot of uh, variation from test to test. So I averaged three or four tests and just. Average the whole thing up in this 1.39 is, is an average uh, of uh, several tests. Well, if you take that one, uh, 20 watts, divide that by a thousand, so that's 0.02 kilowatts times 24 hours a day times 30 days per month at 14 cents per kilowatt hour, then it costs two dollars and two cents to run this unit for one unit for a month. Now however I'm getting 1.39 gallons as compared to 2.09 gallons for the VIC unit so we're kind of wanting to compare the two so I'm going to inflate this two dollars and two cents by the ratio of the output capacity of the two units and I'm going to uh, in inflate this cost per month by this ratio when I came up with three dollars and four cents for the electricity to run the one of these units for a month. So magically what I'm trying to do here is say that I'm going to have a ultrasonic unit that's going to produce the same exact capacity as this VIC unit. So but this is not the total cost. This is important to realize. Uh, for however 100,000 BTUs is required to change one pound of water to vapor. 
and water weighs 8.34 pounds, 345 pounds per gallon. So if you run that number out, 2.09 gallons per day times 30 days times 1,000 BTUs per pound times the weight of the water, 8.345 pounds per gallon, you come up with a 523,232 BTUs per month. Well, where's that, where's that heat coming from? Well, it has to come out of the air in your house. So, I, uh, my son uses, uh, has electric, or has gas heat in his home. This, this particular home is all electric, but I, I assume that probably the majority of the people looking at this video uh, may have uh, uh, a gas heat source for heating their home. And uh, I used his bill and came up with the cost per therm, assuming an 80% efficiency, of $1.67. Now, what is a therm? Well, a therm is 100,000 BTUs. That's all it means. And if you look on your bill, you may see uh, CCF, which stands for 100 cubic feet. Well, it turns out one cubic foot of gas uh, ha is uh, 1,000 BTUs, so 100 times 1,000 a, a BTUs is 100,000 again, so a therm is a, equals 100,000 equals 1 CCF. So, uh, don't want to confuse anybody, this is not rocket science, it's just an easy way to, to give a name to 100,000 BTUs. So, I took the cost of the gas at $1.67 per therm, 523,232 BTUs uh, per month and divide that by 100,000 to get number of therms <coughs> and came up with the gas costing $8.74. So to run one unit, I'm sorry, I said 1.39, I meant 2.39. 09 gallons per day. That means that you're going to need electrical power that's going to cost you $3.04 plus $8.74 for an energy source such as uh, natural gas to, to warm the air back up that's cooled due to the evaporation process. Uh, now, so you come up with $11.78 as compared to $25.50 for uh, the, the warm air humidifier. It's a good deal cheaper, but then if you're going to buy uh, distilled water, for instance, to run this unit, if we're talking about a month's supply of water, a little over two gallons a day, you're probably, what is that, a, for 30 days, that's going to be 61 or 62 gallons a day. If you're dragging that home in gallon jugs, I'm sure that the the uh, cost of your water would eat up the savings here. And so th then the next thing I'd like to point out is there's not a difference in efficiency here in making the the warm air unit more expensive than the ultrasonic unit to run. The difference is in the cost of the fuel. We said that that we were going to use fuel to that when we evaporate a pound of water, it's going to take X amount of BTUs to do that. So that has to be warmed back up from the burning fuel in your house. So, and we said that that fuel costs a dollar sixty-seven per therm. Well, what does electricity cost per therm? Well, actually 100,000 BTUs, there's 3,412 BTUs per kilowatt. And again, at 14 cents a kilowatt hour, it costs $4.10 per therm if you're converting electrical energy directly into BTUs. So, 
keep that in mind if you ever get the idea that you're going to want to heat your house with electric resistance heat. It's, it's not, it's going to be expensive. Okay, I think that pretty well summarizes uh, the cost comparison between the two units. Uh, I will mention that uh, to, to keep an eye on the humidity in your house, you need a, uh, some kind of a hygrometer. And let me grab this. This is a typical unit that we've been using. Uh, in our house here, I think these are less than 12 bucks a unit. And we have three or four of them around the house here. And it says in this particular room that right at the moment it's, uh, it's a combination thermometer and hygrometer. It says that the uh, humidity is 31% and 68 degrees. So this is what I use to keep track of the humidity level in the house. Uh, since the inexpensive little humidifiers that I'm using do not have any kind of humidity controls, when I operate them, they're just pretty much running flat out. As I uh, reviewed the uh, previous uh, clip concerning the uh, cost analysis, I thought perhaps um, I could have done a, a slightly better job in explaining some of the numbers. So I'm going to repeat myself here if you'll just bear with me for a few seconds. And that has to do with uh, some of the energy conversion things here. The one thing, that, again, that I want to emphasize is that when you change water to a vapor, it's going to take energy and the number we're using is 1,000 BTUs. If I have a beaker with a pound of water in it, I'm going to need 1,000 BTUs just to get it to transform from a liquid to a gas. Now, when I begin to talk about selling uh, fuel, natural gas, the gas is sold in hundreds of cubic feet or 100 cubic feet, the CCF stands for, the C stands for 100, the CF stands for cubic feet. So if your bill talks in terms of, if your gas bill talks in terms of CCFs, they're talking about hundreds of cubic feet of gas. And the point I tried to make, again, this magic number of 1,000 showed up again, Natural gas, at the pressure that's supplied to most homes, has a heat content of 1,000 BTUs per cubic foot. That's completely different than the, than the first 1,000 BTUs I where I was talking about converting uh, liquid water into vapor. Then again, the therm, the concept of the therm I put in here, where a therm is defined as 100,000 BTUs or one CCF, one, one unit of 100 cubic feet. And because, because there is 1,000 BTUs per cubic foot, when you multiply the 100 times 1,000, then you get 100,000. So one therm, 100,000 BTUs, 1 CCF, that's, that's all, uh, all the same. So, uh, anyway, so much for repeating myself here. Property medification of your living space will improve the comfort and health of your family. Uh, even though the energy costs for the warm air humidifier is greater than for the ultrasonic unit. I personally prefer the warm air humidifiers and here are a few of the reasons. The warm air type 
can use normal tap water. There's no filter media to buy or replace. During extremely cold weather, I was using uh, uh, over eight gallons per day, and that would be a real hassle to to go to your local market, buy uh, water in gallon jugs, and, and, and drag it home, not to mention the cost. The second thing I like is the high temperature evaporation of the water in the warm air humidifiers. Basically, it's boiled away. And that reduces, I believe, the possibility of a growing mold in the humidifier and uh, sending that, those products of the mold into your airstream. The units are cheap. Uh, our local Walmart sells these. I think the normal list price is around $42 and sometimes you can get them on sale for a good deal less than that. They have a minimum of uh, moving parts, no blower, no pump to replace or repair, just a very simple, easy to use unit. And fourth, the, the thing that I really like about this is that the dissolved minerals that if your water is fairly hard like ours is, the, those minerals are left behind in the unit. And in the evaporative type, those particles end up in the air as a very fine dust, uh, making a kind of a problem for just general house cleaning and, and also possibly uh, lung irritations from the dust in the air. I think you're just better off without that unnecessary dust in, in your airstream. Now, one of the real disadvantages of, of the warm air humidifier is the need to maintain them and as I indicated I usually clean my units about once a week and the following clip uh, shows the technique I use uh, to clean my units. The required maintenance on the VIX unit is, is fairly simple merely remove the water tank, send it off to the side, and remove this chimney. Again, just set it off to the side out of your way. And this device right here, again, goes right over the heater. And you do get a buildup of uh, calcium products or solids on the inside of this chimney and the heating unit which is located here it gets uh, gets covered completely with solids and that can be somewhat difficult to get off now, you've got a little between three and four ounces of water here and in this portion. And uh, this area right here, the water can be hot enough to burn you. So uh, if you just turn the unit off, you need to be a little bit careful. I just pour the water out. Put a little fresh water in here. And take a toothbrush. And just scrub anything that's loose here all around the chimney. And you can maybe see in the camera the water turns a bit milky. Any loose particles tend to show up. And then do the same thing with the chimney here, just with a toothbrush. And in this particular case, the sink I have here has a raised edge. And usually I just fill, I'll bring this in so you can see. This one's not heavily coated, but so you can see. But the white material is the mineral deposits 
and the heating element is kind of a gray finish. Maybe it's got a Teflon finish, I'm not quite sure, but it is, the minerals tend to be bonded fairly, fairly well onto that heating element. So I merely set it down here. and pour enough vinegar, just ordinary white. I believe this is 5% white vinegar. And I go ahead and put the chimney down inside here. And uh, I walk away and leave it for oh, an hour or two. And then when I come back, usually then the chimney, the solids on the chimney are pretty easy to wash off. So I just lift this back out again, rinse out the chimney. Right now I've still got some solids in here. I haven't left it in here long enough to really get it clean. And I take the brush and stir this. And basically, just leave it. I may leave it as long as um, 12, 14 hours. And when I come back, uh, this is usually fairly clean. All right. Okay, now it's uh, about 12 hours later than the previous video clip. And if we just open this up. I can see that the element looks pretty clean. I'm not sure whether I can get this over where the camera can see it or not. But I take a brush and again, anything that's loose, try to knock it off and just dump the vinegar into the sink here. And maybe you can see that the white deposits have completely dissolved into the vinegar during the, during this 12 hour period. Go ahead and rinse this out. I have occasionally left it as long as 24 hours. Usually patience, 24 hours has, has always been adequate for cleaning it. If I clean it once a week, uh, and it's had fairly heavy use, Obviously, if it goes longer than that and the deposits are even heavier, it will take longer for the vinegar to dissolve the unit. So, to dissolve the chemicals or the deposits. So, if I go ahead now and reassemble. Basically, that's it. We're ready to put it back in service. Well, that's it for this time, folks. Hope you found some uh, useful information, and uh, I'll be looking forward to any comments you might have. With that, I'll bid you all a goodbye. <laughs>